This is a bombardier beetle, and it loves chemistry. It produces and stores two chemical compounds, hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide, in separate reservoirs within its abdomen. When threatened, this beetle contracts muscles that force the two chemicals into a cavity containing water and enzymes. When combined, the chemicals undergo a violent chemical reaction, raising the temperature to the near boiling point of water. And what is the boiling point of water? Right, 100 degrees Celsius. As the almost boiling liquid is expelled, it partially becomes a gas and is forced outside the beetle's body, scalding its foes with superheated vapor. But the bombardier beetle's whole body is actually composed of chemicals, not just as defensive spray. In fact, all living organisms are composed of chemicals. So let's dissect someone to find out exactly what they are composed of. Welcome to extreme frog dissection. Since we can virtually dissect any frog we want to, let's go with the red-eyed tree frog, native to Central America. Okay, let's cut this guy into the smallest bits that we can to see what he's made of. Okay, we cut him in half. Is that enough? No? Our fourths good? No? Still not small enough? How about this? Still not small enough? Okay, let's slice and dice as much as we can. Whew! Okay, we can't cut him up anymore. He's in the smallest pieces we can get. So what would we call these pieces? Right, atoms. Atoms are the basic units of matter. We cannot get any smaller particles than an atom using mechanical or chemical means. So anything that takes up space, which we call matter, is composed of atoms. And that includes living organisms. But can we break up atoms using other means? And if so, what do we get? Well, scientists have found many subatomic particles, but most of the particles that make up atoms are not stable. That means that most of the particles change into other types of matter or energy. But we do find three relatively stable subatomic particles, and those are the ones we'll discuss. The first are neutrons, which are found in the nucleus, our center of the atom, and have no charge. This means they are electrically neutral. The next are protons, that are also found in the nucleus of the atom but they have a positive electrical charge. And finally, electrons, which are very small compared to protons and neutrons. Electrons orbit around the nucleus and have a negative electrical charge. This attraction between the positive protons and negative electrons helps to hold the atom together. Now, in reality, the previous model didn't accurately represent the true sizes of the subatomic particles or the spacing. Imagine a huge stadium. We're going to have a baseball represent the atomic nucleus. You know, where the protons and neutrons are found. We are going to place it in the center of the stadium. And then we are going to take a little gnat to represent the electrons and have him fly around the edge of the stadium really, really fast. This would be a much more realistic representation of the relative sizes and spacing in an atom, but it is really hard to draw. There are 92 types of atoms that naturally occur, and each of them is referred to as an element. So if we were to take a big lump of pure gold, it is composed of atoms, and all the atoms are of a specific element, gold. As we discovered earlier with our frog friend, atoms are the units of matter and we can find all the known elements on the periodic table. And here it is. The periodic table contains the 92 naturally occurring elements, as well as elements physicists have produced in the lab. If you have never used a periodic table before, it may look like a bunch of nonsense. But if you know how to read it, the periodic table contains some very useful information. See how each element is represented by a symbol in a little box? Let's look at one of the boxes. Okay, let's see all the neat information we can find out for each element. Here's the elemental symbol. C is the symbol for the element carbon. Each element has a specific symbol. You won't have to learn all of them for this class, just the most important elements found in organisms. Next we have the atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons the element has. Now, this is very important. The proton number defines the element. If an atom has six protons, it must be carbon. 
If an atom is a carbon atom, it must have six protons. If the atomic number changes, we have a different element. And here's the atomic mass, which is the average of the mass numbers for all the different forms of carbon. The mass number is the sum of the protons and neutrons. With most of the atoms you will have to know, the majority of the atoms have as many neutrons as protons. So if carbon has six protons, it has six neutrons, and the mass number is what? Twelve, right. But you say it's not exactly twelve on the box? No, it's almost twelve. Why isn't it exactly twelve, like it should be? Well, there are several reasons, but it partly has to do with neutrons. And what happens if we change the number of neutrons in an atom? You know that if you change the number of protons, you have a different element, but it's not the same with neutrons. Most elements have different forms of atoms called isotopes. Each isotope of an element has a different number of neutrons. Let's take a look at carbon. Carbon has three different isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. How many protons do each of these isotopes have? Six, yes. To be carbon, they all have to have six protons. Now, the number represents the mass number of an isotope. And since the mass number is the sum of the protons and the neutrons, how many neutrons does carbon-12 have? Six, yes. And how many neutrons does carbon-13 have? Seven. And carbon-14? Eight. So the atomic mass of the periodic table shows an average of mass numbers for all the isotopes based on their abundance. Carbon-12 is the most common isotope of carbon, but other heavier isotopes bring the average mass up a bit. Like I said earlier, you will not have to memorize the symbols for all the elements in the periodic table, just the most biologically important ones. Now, this chart shows you those elements with their symbols. We also see the atomic number and how much of that element is commonly found in humans. So you need to make sure you memorize the element and its symbol for your lecture test. You will be provided a copy of the periodic table for your test, but if you don't know how to read it, it will not help you very much. You will practice reading and using the periodic table in lab. The top four elements found in humans are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, CHON for short. You will learn why these elements are so important later on. Let's discuss our last subatomic particle, the electron. Electrons occur in orbitals around the nucleus. The orbitals are arranged in discrete shells, each holding electrons at different energy levels. The electrons in the shell closest to the nucleus have the lowest energy while the electrons in shells further away from the nucleus have more energy. This is because the negative electrons are attracted to the positive protons and are happiest, meaning less energetic, when they are as close as possible. The first electron shell holds a maximum of two electrons. The second shell holds up to eight electrons. And the third shell generally holds up to eight electrons. It can hold more in certain circumstances, but this subject is explored in greater detail in your introductory chemistry class. We will not concentrate on the electron shells of atoms with more than three shells, as it gets a little confusing with additional shells. Now the shell furthest from the nucleus that contains electrons is called the outer shell or the valence shell. For this atom, what is the valence shell? Yes, the third shell. And how many valence electrons are there for this atom? Yes, eight. And we can look at the handy periodic table to find out how many valence electrons elements have for neutral atoms. A neutral atom is one that has the same number of positive protons and negative electrons. If they are not equal in an atom, the atom is charged. But we will talk about charged atoms later. The different columns on the periodic table correspond to a certain number of valence electrons. The first column contains elements whose neutral atoms have one valence electron. Column two elements have two valence electrons. The middle columns are called transition metals. Don't worry about their electrons for our purposes. Column three elements have three valence electrons. And so on. And so forth. Ah, 
All the elements in this column are called noble gases because they have filled valence shells. That means something special in chemistry. Because an atom's chemical properties are determined by their electron configuration. In other words, the distribution of electrons in their electron shells. And it is specifically the valence electrons that determine how atoms react with one another. The noble gas neon has eight valence electrons. It does not need to react with any other atom to fill its valence shell. In fact, all the noble gases in the last row of our periodic table have full valence shells. We call them stable or inert atoms, as they are not reactive. But most atoms do not have full valence shells and must react with other atoms to achieve stability. As you can see, nitrogen does not have a full valence shell. How many electrons does it need to be stable? Right, it has five valence electrons. So nitrogen needs to react with another atom, or atoms, to obtain three more electrons. Now for some terminology. In science, when we use the word molecule, we mean there are two or more atoms that are reacting with one another. These atoms are bound together in order to achieve full valence shell. When we use the term compound, the atoms in the molecule consist of more than one type of atom. Hydrogen atoms are not stable, as they only have one valence electron. Hydrogen can react with itself, as we see here. Is it a molecule? Yes, there are two or more atoms interacting. Is it a compound? No, there is only one type of atom, hydrogen. Water consists of an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Is it a molecule? Yes, there are two or more atoms interacting. Is it a compound? Yes, there is more than one type of atom, oxygen and hydrogen. Now, the interactions we find between atoms in a molecule are called chemical bonds. And there are two main types of chemical bonds that atoms form with other atoms to achieve stability. Ionic bonds, in which atoms gain or lose electrons, and covalent bonds, in which atoms share electrons. Chemical bonds can be seen as a continuum. In some molecules, we see the atoms playing nice with each other and equally sharing their electrons, while in other interactions, atoms steal electrons from their partners. Let's first look at covalent bonds. Atoms that are covalently bonded may share electrons equally. Let's look at a molecule of hydrogen. As we discussed earlier, a lone hydrogen cannot exist on its own and can react with another hydrogen atom to fill that first valence shell. These two electrons are shared equally between both hydrogen atoms, filling the first shell for both. Are both atoms happy and stable? Yes, by sharing. This hydrogen has access to two valence electrons. That's a full first valence shell. And this atom also has access to those two electrons and has a filled valence shell. We can represent covalent bonds in many different ways. We can write the molecular formula H2. The H is the symbol for hydrogen, while the 2 indicates there are two atoms of hydrogen in this molecule. We can show how the electrons are distributed and shared, as in the electron distribution diagram. We can simplify this and show the Lewis dot structure in which the valence electrons of the atoms are shared with dots, or the more popular structural formula, which only represents shared electrons with a line. As you can see, one line represents two shared electrons. And the space-filling model represents the molecule more realistically, with the union of electron orbitals. In the space-filling model, white is commonly used for the hydrogen atoms. Like hydrogen, oxygen atoms cannot exist on their own. How many electrons does each oxygen need to have a full valence shell? Yes, two. And an oxygen atom can share two electrons with another oxygen atom to achieve stability. So here are the ways we can represent oxygen molecules. If you notice, how many lines are between the two oxygen atoms in the structural formula? Yes, there are two lines and how many electrons are shared in total when two oxygen atoms are covalently bonded? Yes, four. Remember, each line represents two shared electrons. 
This is the best time to introduce the concept of electronegativity. Okay, big word, but don't be scared. Electronegativity is the attraction, or affinity, an atom has for electrons. Let's look at an example. Oxygen has a high degree of electronegativity. Why? Well, it needs two electrons to be stable, right? Not that many, just two. And it has how many protons in its nucleus? Eight, right. With all those positive protons, it has a strong affinity for electrons. But if we pair it with another atom that has the same degree of electronegativity, another atom of oxygen, what do you think will happen? Well, while one of them wants the electrons, the other oxygen atom wants the electrons just as much. So it's a stalemate. Neither oxygen atom can pull the electrons closer to itself because both atoms in the molecule have the same electronegativity, the same hunger for electrons. This results in a nonpolar covalent bond. Neither pole of this oxygen molecule has more electrons than the other. Both atoms have equal possession of those four shared electrons. Okay, do you remember what the formula for water is? Right, H2O. How do you think the atoms are arranged in this molecule? Who shares electrons with who? Well, think about who needs what. So the hydrogens need one electron each? Should they bond with each other? No, that leaves oxygen out. So how many electrons does oxygen need? Two? How should they all hook up? Right. Does everyone have filled valent shells? Yes. And here's the different ways we can represent water. Now, do you think the atoms in water all share those electrons equally? Well, the hydrogens need one electron, but each has only one measly proton in their nucleus. That's a lot less than oxygen. So compared to oxygen, do you think the hydrogens are more or less electronegative? Oxygen has a much greater affinity for electrons than the hydrogens do. And when they form a molecule, the electrons are not equally shared, as oxygen attracts the electrons more strongly and they spend more time in oxygen's valence shell than they do in the hydrogen's valence shells. This type of covalent bond is called a polar covalent bond. This results in the oxygen's pole of the molecule having a slight negative charge as the negative electrons spend more time at that end. The hydrogen pole has a slightly positive charge as the electrons spend less time at this end of the molecule. We will talk about this in more detail in the next lecture. Now it's time to move on to the next bond. Let's look at when atoms don't play nice with each other in the form of an ionic bond. Ionic bonds form between atoms with very different electronegativities. Let's take sodium and chlorine. How many valence electrons do they have? Right, sodium has one, while chlorine has seven. Which do you think has a greater electronegativity? Right, since chlorine only needs one and has more protons in its nucleus than sodium, it is more electronegative. But are either happy alone? No. Both are unstable, as they do not have full valence shells. So if chlorine just needs one more electron to be stable, and is highly electronegative, what do you think it will do? Yes, chlorine will steal sodium's one lonely valence electron. Are both atoms now stable? Yes, they now both have eight electrons in their valence shells. They are happy and stable. but. Are the atoms still neutral? Remember, if the protons and electrons equal each other, the atom has a neutral charge. Well, are they? No, since sodium lost an electron, it now has 10 negative electrons and 11 positive protons. Overall, that gives it a positive charge. Chlorine gained an electron, so it now has 18 negative electrons and 17 positive protons making it negatively charged. Charged atoms are called ions, 
and we can give them specific names depending on what kind of charge they have. Positive ions are called cations, and negative ions are called anions. The oppositely charged ions are attracted to each other, and this forms the ionic bond. When this occurs between sodium and chlorine, we get sodium chloride. When lots of chlorine and sodium atoms get together, crystals are formed. The salt you put on your food is a mass of sodium and chlorine atoms ionically bonded to one another, forming a structure called a crystal lattice.